miracles of the master and focus on Jesus calming the storm. So we're going to have a couple, a look at a few of the different passages in the gospel that records this event for us. We're going to have a look at what they tell us and see if there's any differences and ultimately to see what we can learn from this event because there's a teaching purpose, isn't there? Everything that Christ set out to do had a teaching purpose. Whether it was turning water into wine or healing the lame man, raising the dead or calming a great storm. His life was dedicated to bringing people to an understanding of his father, the work that he'd set out to, and the work that he'd set out to do. And this event is no different. We're going to see that the disciples are indeed human. They have the same doubts and fears that you and I have every single day. They, like us, don't always understand the ways in which God works. They, like us, get stressed being in different difficult situations and they struggle to see how we could possibly come out of these situations. So these are the three kind of take-home points that we're going to try and uh, bring out today. The first, have confidence to get in the boat with Christ. The second that we're going to look at is trying to practice faith and not fear. And the final point that we're going to consider is that the end goal for everything that we do has to be working towards peace with Christ and that's directly tied to our faith. So these are the three references um, in the New Testament that we have about this event. The first is in uh, Matthew 8, verse 23 to 27, uh, which we've had read for us. The second is Mark 4, verse 35 to 41. And the third is Luke chapter 8, verse 22 to 25. We're going to spend most time on the first two, as once we get there, the second one, the others have kind of pretty much covered it. So we're going to have a look at those and see what lesson we can get out of it. Flick across, before we look at um, Matthew, flick across with me to Mark chapter 4. I'm just going to start there and just get a little bit of context to see kind of what's happening before they go out onto the boat. So we look at Mark chapter 4 and verse 1. I've got on the slide there as well. It's a little bit small, sorry. So in Mark chapter 4 and verse 1, it says, Again he began to teach by the, beside the sea, and a very large crowd gathered about him, so that he got into a boat and sat in it on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land, and he was teaching many, th many of them things in parables, and in his teaching, he said to them, and he goes on um, teaching a parable about the sower. So Christ is teaching beside the sea. He's on a boat. There's a very large crowd gathered around him. There's many people that followed him around to listen to him. So he gets in the boat and continues to teach so that everyone can see him. Um, and it says that he's teaching many things, and the things that he was teaching were in parables. Um, you don't have to turn there, but Matthew 7, verse 28 to 29, mentions that the people who heard what Christ were talking about were absolutely astonished by his teaching because he was teaching as one who had authority, um, which they didn't get from the scribes. It was a notable difference. And if you cast your eye in this chapter to uh, verse 10, uh, which 10 to 12, and when he was alone, those around him with the 12 asked him about the parables and he said to them to you has been given the secret of the kingdom of god but for those outside everything is in parables so that they may indeed see but not perceive and may indeed hear but not understand unless they should turn and should be forgiven christ would speak these parables to the multitude but not explain all the ins and outs of them to everyone when instead, when the crowd had dispersed, he would pull his disciples aside and it says he would explain the secret to the kingdom of God as though uh, these were the ones who were going to continue the Lord's work once he had gone. And if you just flick across the page to verse 24, he says uh, in the parable of lamp under a basket, he says, pay attention to what you hear with the measure you use, it will be measured to you and still more will be added to you. So the key was to listen carefully to what Christ was saying 
Because if you're only half listening, you wouldn't really have any idea what he was talking about. You might only gr grasp a little tiny bit. In the parallel record of uh, Luke chapter 8, verse 1 to 2, I'll just read it for you. He says, He, being Christ, went through the cities and villages proclaiming and bringing the good news of the kingdom of God, and the twelve disciples were with him. A great crowd from the town gathered around him to listen and to teach. So this was Christ's mission, wasn't it? It's the mission of those who came before him, and it's our purpose too, to bring the good news of the kingdom of God to all of those people we see. So this is essentially the picture that we've got. We've got Jesus in the boat, surrounded by his disciples, and a massive crowd of people. They're here to hear his teaching. So in the three parallel records, I kind of just highlighted the actions of Christ in blue and the actions of the disciples in green. So you can kind of quickly see, see who's doing what. So if we go over to Matthew chapter 8 now, we can start getting into it. Um, just before we get to this, still turn to Matthew chapter 8, but we'll start in verse 18, and we'll read verse 18 to 22. Now when Jesus saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go over to the other side. And a scribe came up to him and said, Teacher, I will follow you wherever you go. And Jesus said to him, Foxes have holes and birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man has nowhere to rest his head. Another of the disciples said to him, Lord, let me first go bury my father. And Jesus said to him, Follow me and leave the dead to bury their own dead. So as we had read for us, Christ had just spent time healing at Peter's mother-in-law's house. She was sick with the fever. After that, lots of people heard what he had done, what he was doing, and they came to him and he healed heaps of people. Um, he cast out demons, spirits, and he healed those who were sick. And after all of this, it's understandable that Christ was tired. If you look at verse 18, it says, Now when Christ saw a crowd around him, he gave orders to go to the other side. So we're talking the other side of the Sea of Galilee. And in verse 20, he says, Foxes have holes, the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man have, has nowhere to lay his head. And this was true from the moment he was born, wasn't it? If you think back to Luke, when we're thinking about his birth, in Luke 2 verse 7 it says, She gave to her firstborn son and wrapped him in swaddling cloths and laid him in a manger, because there was no place for them in the inn. So from the moment of Christ's birth, he didn't have anywhere to rest his head. Even the Lord needed rest. But it wasn't easy for him. He rose early in the morning often to converse with his father, to become refreshed or late at night conversing with his father in prayer before the day ahead of him. So we're on the edge of the Sea of Galilee. I was looking at um, the geology of it and I found one geologist commented on it and he said this, he said, the Sea of Galilee was known for suddenly becoming dangerous with strong winds and rough seas. The area is subject to earthquakes and in the past volcanic activity. This is evidenced by the abundant basalt and other volcanic rocks that define the geology. Due to its low-lying position in the rift valleys surrounded by hills, the sea is prone to sudden violent storms, hence the New Testament record about Jesus calming the storm. Indeed, the main feature of the lake seems to be its ever-changing character. It's interesting that the writer included this event in um, his description. The sea that they were about to cross was prone to sudden and violent storms. Let's read this section now in verse 23 to 27. And when he got into the boat, his disciples followed him. And behold, there arose a great storm on the sea, so that the boat was being swamped by waves. But he was asleep. And they went and woke him, saying, Save us, Lord, we are perishing. And he said to them, Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? Then he rose and rebuked the winds and the sea, and there was a great calm. And the men marveled, saying, What sort of man is this that even the winds and sea obey him? So he gets into... He gets in his boat and his disciples follow him. It's the first step, they follow him. And we're told in verse 24 that sometime throughout their journey, 
a great storm arose on the sea. And it was so great that the, that the boat was being swamped by waves. And that's the idea of water collecting in low places. If you've been on a boat, you don't want water in any, pretty much anywhere. Now, I'm sure lots of us have been in boats before, fishing boats or a big cruise ship or something like that. But it doesn't really matter the size of the boat. The swell affects all boats. And you know how uncomfortable it gets when the swell picks up. It becomes hard to stand, or if you're fishing, hard to fish or get jobs done, hard to have a conversation, hard to concentrate, hard to even manoeuvre around in the boat. In a very short period of time, you could go from feeling completely safe to feeling in danger or risking serious damage. So when you first look at this, it's kind of understandable that the disciples are scared. I immediately felt for them. Um, it'd be such a natural feeling being on the water to be terrified in a raging storm. So it says the boat was swamped by waves. And I thought it'd be interesting because we're talking about wooden fishing boats to think about you know, the weight of a wave. If water's pulling into a um, fishing boat, it's not gonna go too well. So I looked at the science of it and when looking at an average wave, a cubic metre of water weighs about a tonne. So a metre by a metre by a metre weighs about a tonne. So if you had a 10 foot wave, that's 20 feet long, that's 410 tonnes of water. So this is described as a great storm. So if you think about these towering waves, that's not even a ridiculously big wave, but one cubic metre of water weighs about a tonne. So if you put yourself in, these, in this boat, there's giant waves crashing on the ship. It's the weight of 400 plus tonnes, every single wave, and it's tossing this little fishing boat around. The boat starts taking on water. Even a small wave has enough weight to sink a ship. It's no wonder they're petrified, isn't it? It's almost, reading this, it almost seems insane that Christ could be asleep during this. Jesus is sound asleep. He's enjoying his moment of peace. Peace from performing the miracles and preaching to crowds and people. He finally has a place to rest his head. And I just love that, how it says he's just asleep, just like such a st simple statement. It makes it seem like his action is the normal thing to do and everyone else panic is doing something strange. The disciples just can't believe it. They wake him up in a state of panic they, and they say in verse 25, save us, Lord, we are perishing. And I think it's fair to say the 12 weren't wrong to wake Jesus there, would you? If you're in that situation and someone was sleeping, it would probably be appropriate to wake him up and warn them of the impending doom of the ship sinking. Ask him to grab a bucket and start bailing water or suggest that he might need to get ready to swim if the boat's going down or ask for some guidance or direction on what we could do next. In moments of severe trial, it becomes a lot easier when you've got people around you. Violent storms and little ships are an unpleasant combination. And I'm sure Christ's response to this situation would have completely thrown the disciples. They obviously were in a state of desperation and the only person they thought that was capable of helping them was obviously the Lord, and he was asleep. And they were absolutely correct in that assumption that the Lord was the only one that could help them. But from his slumber, he wakes and he says, Why are you afraid? O oh, you of little faith. Seems like such a strange question to ask. I mean, there's probably more that happened in this conversation, but what do you think the disciples' response would have been? They would have been looking around going, well, can you see the water? You're sleeping in water. There's waves crashing. We're being shaken all over the place. Maybe I can't swim heaps well. We're about to go under. What do you mean we're afraid? Why are we afraid? In that moment, it probably would have caused the disciples to stop and think for a second. In their moment of desperation, they've had this question from the Lord. Why are you afraid, O you of little faith? And that's classic Christ, isn't it? He always asks these thought-provoking questions. 
you have to stop and think. I'm sure all the people around were stopped and were wondering what to do. And while they're doing this, Christ stops, he stands up, he turns and he looks out of the boat and he rebukes the winds and the sea and straight away there's a great calm. So while they're, while they're thinking about Christ's question, they're still panicking, he just gets up, a simple action, he rebukes the wind and the sea and straight away there's calm. Their response in verse 27, they marvel and say, what sort of man is this that even the winds and the seas obey him? He rebukes the wind. It's this idea of sharp disapproval to what someone or something is doing. It's their behaviour. So like um, Phil was saying on Sunday in his exhort about Archie coming out with his clothes on back to front, all that kind of stuff, and he's just disappointed in Archie's actions. This is like what Christ is doing. He's standing up and he's looking at the wind and it's like he's disappointed in what they're doing, in what the wind's doing. They're being absolutely battered from all sides and he's annoyed at the wind. It's almost like a parent telling a child to cut it out. This must have been such a confusing experience for the disciples. It just would have had to be. Some of them had grown up on the Sea of Galilee. They were professional fishermen. Andrew, James, Peter and John, it was their job. They would have seen these storms countless times and yet they were still terrified. So I think that really speaks volumes to how great this storm must have been. They'd seen Christ heal all kinds of ailments from demons to fevers and now once again they were amazed saying, what sort of man is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? In seemingly impossible situations, we need to make sure that we're in the boat with Christ because with the power from his Father, he calms the storm. He makes them stop instantly. We might not have ideas on how, or solutions on how to fix a problem, but our Lord does. The fear for their lives kind of remind, it kind of, I kind of thought about it and I was thinking, it's similar to those, the crowds of the people that desired healing and they're just grabbing out, trying to grab Christ, touch him just so Jesus could do something for them. Jesus had told the disciples he had a purpose for them and the purpose wasn't fulfilled yet. And you'd think that this alone would be a reassuring thing um, because Christ's purpose hasn't been fulfilled yet. But in the moment the faith draws close to them, it's not enough to trust him with their lives. And we know that Jesus was born of a woman. He has the same experience as us, so he understands the human limitations. He only teaches the crowds as much as they can hear, letting the simpler message simmer in their hearts until they're ready for more. But he expects the 12 to have a better understanding of, and not have such limitations because of the extra insight that he was given. So that's the Matthew record. Let's quickly flick over to Mark and we'll have a look what he adds uh, and we'll see how anything changes there. So we'll go to Mark 4, verse 35 to 41. So I'm not going to spend too much time here because the records are all pretty similar. We'll just, we'll, I'll just show you Luke, but we're not really going to talk too much about it because it doesn't really add anything extra that these two don't. Um, the main point of... Uh, we'll just read it, sorry. Uh, verse 35 to 41 of Mark 4. On that day, when evening had come, he said to them, let us go across the other side. And leaving the crowd, they took with him them in the boat, just as he was, and other boats were with him. And a great windstorm arose, and the waves were breaking into the boat, so the boat was already filling. But he was in the stern, asleep on the cushion. And they woke him and said, Teacher, do you not care that we are perishing? And he awoke, and he rebuked the wind and said to the sea, Peace, be still. And the wind ceased, and there was a great calm. And he said to them, Why are you afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, Who is this 
that even the wind and the sea obey him. So the first point of difference is in verse 36. Um, It says, other boats were with them. So they're not alone on this journey. They're making the journey across to the other side with some other boats. That kind of uh, means there's even more panic going on. If you were thinking just one boat in Matthew, they're already freaking out. You imagine if there's multiple boats with them, people would have been really worried. Everyone would have been panicking. But it also means there was more people to witness the work that Christ was about to perform. Just like the raising of Lazarus, it's even more impactful that Lazarus died before Christ came to him than it was then now that he's risen. So Mark's record says that waves were breaking on the boat, so similar to the other one, it's a sure sign that it was gonna sink. Uh, Mark mentions that Christ is in the stern, so I believe that's the back of the boat, and it adds that he's asleep on a cushion, so he's pretty comfy sleeping in this chaos. He's awoken by a message saying, teacher, do you not care that we, pe- we are perishing? He awakes, Mark records the words, peace be still in verse 29, uh, 39, sorry. He awoke and rebuked the wind and said, peace be still and the wind cease and there was a great calm. And then he asked the question of whether or not they have no faith. In Matthew, it says they marveled at his work. But if we have a look at verse 41 of Luke, And they were filled with great fear. So Christ asked them, why are you so afraid? Have you still no faith? And they were filled with great fear and said to one another, who then is this that even the wind and the sea obey him? So they're filled with great fear. They've just had a great fear. They thought they were about to sink. They thought they were going to have to swim. They thought they were about to perish. And after seeing Christ's actions, they're filled with a greater fear. What could be worse? Was it the fear of the power that Christ possessed? After all, they just said, you know, he can control the wind and the sea. They'd seen everything that he had done. Or was it fear that he'd question their faith? Or maybe they had failed his little test. After all, we've said Jesus had always spent extra time talking with his disciples, explaining all of these things, the way he operates. In the previous chapter, Christ cleansed the leper who had faith to come to Christ saying, Lord, if you will, you can make me clean. The leper knew that Christ had the power to do so. He had no right to approach Christ as he was unclean, but he showed absolute faith in Christ and the power that Christ had from God. There's also the faith of the centurion they had seen. It says, Christ says of him, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. Go, let it be done, for you have believed. And his servant was healed at that very minute. So they had seen these great examples of faith. And they had really struggled with this. In Matthew chapter 6 and verse 30, it says, But if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown into the oven... He will not much more clothe you, O you of little faith. Therefore, don't be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. Therefore, do not be anxious for tomorrow, about tomorrow, for tomorrow will be anxious for itself, sufficient for the day its own trouble fear not for tomorrow for your heavenly father knows all that you need and i'm not suggesting that we shouldn't be scared if i was in that situation i'm sure all of us would be if any of us were there but as the disciples learn whilst life's not always easy with its twists and turns and great storms we can with absolute certainty believe that our god is with us and he works in our lives so that we can have peace So it's about working on faith and not on fear. In John 14, verse 27, it says, Peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives, do I give to you, like Ben mentioned in his prayer. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. 
Peace be still, be not afraid, let your hearts be troubled. After this, it says, you can just see at the start of chapter 5, they come to the other side of the sea, so they make it there, and when Jesus steps out of the boat, immediately a man runs out to him. So his moment of rest is over already. He's, he's had his moment of peace in the midst of a raging storm. As soon as he gets to the other side, he's greeted by someone who runs out and he's got work to do again. In all these accounts, we have a contrast of this great storm versus a great calm, don't we? It's a massive storm, absolute restlessness, and then Christ intervenes and we have this peaceful picture of a beautiful lake and a calm ship. In all these accounts, Christ rebukes the wind and the sea and straight away there's peace. Turn with me to Psalm 107. In Psalm 107 is a psalm of the redeemed. Psalm 107, we'll start at verse 23. Some went down, verse 23, some went down to the sea in ships doing business on the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord, his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind which lifted up the waves in the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. And this is us and this is the disciples, isn't it? Our courage melts away. They reeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wit's end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still and the waves of the sea were hushed. Then they were glad that the waters were quiet and he brought them to their desired haven. Let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love for his wondrous works to the children of man. And I think it's fair to say that we've all experienced times in our lives where we would probably consider it to be a great storm. Everything's upside down, we're getting hit left and right. The waves are breaking on top of us. Times where everything around us seems dark, it feels dark, where we feel like we've got no one to turn to for support. Like it says in the Psalm, They went down to the depths in verse 26. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They reeled and staggered at their wit's end. They cried to the Lord in their distress and he delivered them. And that's exactly the same language that we have in the gospel records in Matthew, Mark and Luke. It's always he and they talking about God in this case, um, as we've said. But everything that Christ did in this gospel record, in this account, was to bring a deeper understanding of the work that he was doing, the work of his father in the coming kingdom. And it's another reminder to us, isn't it, that when we're distressed and we cry out to God in our troubles, he's there for us. No matter how big the storm, no matter how much our faith is tested, if we're in the, bo- if we're in the boat with Christ, the storm will pass. And even more than that, it will be calm. There will be peace. And as we saw in this psalm, he brings us to our desired haven. And what's our response then? If we read verse 31, let them thank the Lord for his steadfast love, for his wondrous works to the children of man. We should be thankful when we come out of these situations when we have peace and we arrive at our desired haven. That is the work that God does with us. Now, faith is tied to peace. If we flick over to Luke chapter 7. We'll look at Luke chapter 7 and we'll just read uh, verse 44 to 50. So this is the sinful woman who's forgiven. Luke chapter 7, verse 44 to 50. 
I'll just read it for you now. It says, Then turning towards the woman, he said to Simon, Do you see this woman? I entered your house. You gave me no water for my feet. But she has wet my feet with her tears and wiped them with her hair. You gave me no kiss. But from the time I came in, she has, ceased, she has not ceased to kiss my feet. You did not anoint my head with oil, but she has anointed my feet with ointment. Therefore, I tell you, her sins, which are many, are forgiven. For she loved much, but he who is forgive, forgiven little, loves little. And he said to her, your sins are forgiven. Then those who were at the table with him began to say among themselves, who is this who even forgives sins? And he said to this woman, your faith has saved you. Go in peace. This woman anoints Christ's feet with her feet, with her tears, sorry, wiped her feet with her hair, kissed his feet, anointed him, and he showed, she showed love. And as a result, he says, because of your faith, you are saved. Go in peace. And this is kind of the direct contrast to the disciples in the boat. He questions, Where's the, where is your faith? He rebukes the wind and the sea, and then there's peace. And it's our faith that saves us, isn't it? If we have confidence and faith in Christ and the work that he set out to do for his Father, then we have peace from the storms around us. The roaring winds, the thunder, the lightning, the crashing seas are all calm. They have no power with Christ in the, bo in the boat. In Psalm 33, verse 6, it says, 6 to 9, says, By the word of the Lord the heavens were made, and by the breath of his mouth all their host. He gathers the water of the seas as a heap. He puts the deeps in storehouses. Let all the earth fear the Lord. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For as he spoke, it came to be. He commanded, and it stood firm. So, what are our what are our take homes for this series of events? Well, we've got to get in the boat with Christ. We've got to have confidence to be with Christ, to jump in the boat and follow him through the rougher seas. We so often fear we're in trouble, we get swamped by waves crashing around us, but with Christ in the boat, the storms will pass. We need to remember to practice faith and not fear. The disciples chose fear before they chose faith. But today, we can start again. We can have the opportunity to choose faith over fear. Even in the small things in our life, we can have assurance that God has control. We'll just finish with this one. Peace with Christ is directly tied to our faith. At the end of Luke chapter 1, in verse 77 to 79, it's talking about God. It says, He gives knowledge of salvation to his people in the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our, of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in dark places and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. God has provided us a way of peace, which is through his son. So let's get in the boat with Christ, practice faith, not fear, and have confidence in our, that our peace is tied directly with Christ and our faith. Thanks. Mm -hmm.